Okay, so let's go ahead and let's start to take a look at some of the slides from chapter one and uh, see if we can uh, see, uh, get some of the basic understanding of uh, some of the terminology that we're going to be then using in our uh, later chapters. Now, um, again, as I've said, this gets a little frustrating at first because I think that uh, we're really uh, trying to get you used to some of the terminology that we will be then using in some of the later chapters. And you're going to see in your homework um, an expectation that you understand some of this, these terms. Um, and I think as we go through the later chapters and the later homework assignments, you're going to get more and more comfortable uh, with some of these terms. So let's just go over and first compare uh, our auditing class to uh, other accounting classes. And of course, in your introductory to accounting, you're just understanding the basics about debits and credits and the various accounts, assets, liabilities, revenues, expenses, etc. And then you get into your intermediate, and you really start getting into the rules of the Financial Accounting Standards Board, the International Accounting Standards Board, understanding your international financial reporting standards, your U.S. GAAP, and how those are applied to prepare financial statements. In auditing, what we're going to do is take that information and really take the evidence that is in support of those financial statements and see if the auditor can analyze that in a logical manner to be able to come to conclusions about the financial statements and uh, determine if those financial statements are fairly stated. So we're going to be doing more analysis in this class and just understanding how we will be analyzing data to be able to determine that the financial statements are fairly stated. So uh, more of a focus on our analytical skills and uh, we'll be looking at standards uh, in the next couple of chapters understanding uh, standards promulgated by the AICPA's Auditing Standard Board and the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board for public companies. So we will be looking at standards, but those standards are really uh, providing the auditor guidance uh, to be able to analyze the evidence that supports the financial statements. So we'll be thinking much more in those terms rather than just following the rules of the accounting standards. Now, when we look at... Uh, this information we look at in the context of uh, public companies. Okay, so they have Wall Street here uh, for a reason and that often uh, we're considering public companies uh, when we do an audit of financial statements. And that's not to say that a non-public company couldn't have an audit of their financial statements, but uh, often we focus on public companies because we're going to see that we will uh, frequently have that separation of uh, the management and ownership of the company that we were just talking about a couple of minutes ago. They talk about for the last 200 years there has been an explosion in demand for assurance, assurance services and um, I think that for our purposes in the United States we can think about the real demand coming after the stock market crash 1939, 1929, excuse me, the securities laws of 33, 34 that uh, started requiring that auditors come in independently, independent auditors come in and give assurance over the financial statements. And of course, uh, that uh, has been in place uh, for some time now. And again, focus here uh, with some of these graphics you can see on public companies, although it doesn't mean that a non-public company also wouldn't want uh, some sort of audit involvement with their financial statements. Now, we talked about the absentee ownership, and we talk about having our managers, of course, who are um, going to be like the agents, and they're going to be running the day-to-day -day aspects of the business, but that is separate from our principals, our stockholders, who are the owners. And we're going to see that what the auditors are going to do is provide that independent assurance uh, that will allow the owners of the company to understand that management is carrying out its management stewardship through the audit of the financial statements. So you start to take a look with a key word, the auditor provides credibility to those financial statements. So that's a word that you want to remember because we increase the credibility of the financial statements as auditors because of our independent function in looking at that evidence in support of the financial statements. Now, it's important to note that the agent is the one that is going to um, hire the auditor. So it literally is 
Um, and when we say the agent, you're thinking that's management. It's really the board of directors that hires the auditor and oversees the auditor. And we say the board of directors, a more general term is those charged with governance. But uh, board of directors, audit committees, they hire the auditors. They oversee the audit um, in, in talking to that independent auditor, making sure that things are going so smoothly, that management is cooperating. Uh, but it is not the principals, the owners, that hire the auditor. It really is going to be the agents in the form of the board of directors. And so uh, that always brings in a little bit of question as to our independence. Are we truly independent if it is the company themselves that are hiring us? Um, but uh, auditors are to maintain professional skepticism, independence at all times, and uh, we're very vigilant about that. But uh, we are hired by the board of directors, and we're literally going to talk about uh, client acceptance uh, steps here when we look at a, at a high level at some of the key steps in an audit in some of the upcoming slides. All right, guys, you want to get the pen. I'll t sometimes if you talk to the computer, it'll do what you want it to. So let me just get the pen here. And we can see that we have three categories. We have one, two, three categories of assertions and then the first category contains all six of the assertions so we have a total of six assertions three four five six I think you can see that without me counting them there for you but you have the six assertions okay now let's look at these three categories and when we look at the three categories we can see that we have assertions about classes of transactions for the period under audit for the current year. When you think of that category of assertions, I want you to think about your journals. Okay, so we're talking about under the current audit period, we're talking about our journals. So what happens? We have in here as an example of an assertion or one of our assertions cut off. We'll do procedures to make sure that items included in the journals for this year, our sales journal, that we only included transactions that happen in this period. So we will go and we'll do procedures near the end of the year to make sure that they didn't, and I'm doing annoying quotes even though you can't see me here in the air, uh, to make sure that management did not accidentally, and I'm putting accidentally because they could do it on purpose, did not accidentally, could be doing it intentionally, which would mean it is fraud instead of an error, but management could, whether by accident or intentionally, include items in this year's financial statements that actually should have been included in the next year's financial statements. Now, why would they do that on purpose? Maybe they're trying to increase their sales this year. So we'll do some procedures near year end to make sure that um, only the transactions that happen this year actually fall into this year. Occurrence. We're going to do some procedures to make sure that if they're including a sale this year, it actually occurred this year. Completeness, that all the sales for this year, again, talking about our journals, our sales journal, for all the sales for this year were properly included. And you can see some of those other assertions there. Now, we've already talked about existence of assets and rights and obligations of assets. And you take a look at uh, our next category here, or what we've numbered here as uh, category number two. And when you take a look here, we're talking about assertions about account balances at the end of the period. So in this case, it doesn't matter when we purchase this asset. It doesn't matter. We could have purchased it two years ago, but if we are still including it on the financial statements, then it should still exist. Notice that cutoff does not appear in this category of assertions because we're talking about now whatever year the transaction occurred, it should be included in the financial statements. So we're not nearly as interested as year -end, in year-end procedures as we were under our transactions, our journals for the current year. Then we get into assertions about presentation and disclosure. When you think about presentation and disclosure, you want to think about footnotes. That's really what we're talking about. So we're thinking that all disclosures that should have been included in the financial statements this year are properly included. And we're really thinking about our footnotes there. Okay. Now, this slide, again, as I had uh, said earlier, is probably the most important uh, slide we're going to look at in this chapter and that uh, you need to probably go ahead and memorize these assertions. And then as we go through the course, what we're going to be doing is we're literally going to be seeing how we would apply audit procedures 
to help us obtain evidence in support that management has fairly stated the assertions in the financial statements. And everything we do in this class will center around these financial statement assertions. And so you're going to get into some of the later chapters and where students sometimes have trouble with auditing is they feel like they're just memorizing a bunch of procedures for the cash account, for the receivables, for inventory, for our revenues and expenses on our income statement. It feels like you're just memorizing procedures. And the reality is what you're doing is you're applying procedures to obtain evidence about the financial statement assertions. And so if you're looking at an audit procedure, and you don't know how it helps you to obtain evidence for a particular assertion, then you don't understand that audit procedure. And sometimes I'll tell my uh, students who are uh, working and studying for the CPA exam that, that if you're doing an audit procedure and you can't tell me how that's helping you to obtain evidence about an assertion, you are not doing your job properly. So when we look at these account balances, we're going to be focusing about these assertions. So very important slide for us. Okay, going over to the next slide, and you can see uh, that they're talking about the auditor uh, and they're talking about management here. And um, I think this slide works well when we look at it sort of going down here and that management is responsible ultimately for preparing those financial statements. So that's uh, part of our discussion question uh, for this chapter in which I talked about the different responsibilities between management and the auditor. Management is responsible for the financial statements. Now, how do they carry out that responsibility? Well, one of the first thing they're going to do is put a system of internal control in place. And that system of internal control is going to allow them to uh, get some comfort level that if there are misstatements, they will be prevented or detected. So if you want to think of internal controls like a roof over your house, it starts to rain, the rain is the misstatements and the financial statements, and what happens? If we have a nice roof, we stay dry, no rain gets in the house. If we have a good set of internal controls over our financial statements, we're going to be much more comfortable that these misstatements will not affect our financial statements. And again, when we talk about misstatement, whether caused by error or fraud. So we put a good system of internal controls and then as we conduct those transactions, there should be reliability in our financial reporting as we uh, affect transactions and then accumulate those and ultimately report them into our financial statements. Now again, we're going to issue the financial statements to users. And again, we're talking about users as these absentee owners, which are really investors, those who are going to maybe buy our stock. But they could also be creditors, maybe a bank that's going to give us a loan, etc. And they're using those financial statements to make decisions about whether to loan money, buy stock, etc. And so there's making those decisions. Those are our users of the financial statements. But before the user will want to use those financial statements, they will want to see that the auditor has provided a report, an opinion, and that opinion will state whether or not the auditor believes that the financial statements are fairly stated. So going back up, the auditor will obtain evidence. What is going to be the source of that evidence? The source of that evidence is going to be the information that was used to prepare those financial statements. Now, when you think of the information, you may think of books and records, invoices, journals, uh, ledgers, um, electronic fund transfer, evidence of electronic fund transfer, etc. And yes, that is evidence, but it's not just those documents itself. It's also the auditor's cooperating evidence. Evidence, the procedures that the auditor applies to that evidence that then comes in the form of tests of our assertion. So we will be looking at evidence, documents, yes, but it's the way we look at those documents. It's the procedures that we apply to those documents, and we apply those procedures based on our uh, desire to determine that the assertions in the financial statements are fairly stated. And then once we do that, uh, we can form our conclusions and we end up uh, with our audit report that accompanies the financial statements. So, nice little um, overview of uh, how evidence and assertions relate to the management responsibility for the financial statements and the auditor's responsibility to issue an opinion on those financial statements. Going over to the next slide, three key uh, terms that we're going to want to understand here. One is going to be our audit risk, 
the other is materiality, and um, we'll, uh, we've already started to, uh, to talk about evidence, and evidence, of course, is going to uh, support our financial statements. So let's just go over and talk about materiality. What makes something material? A fact is material if it could change the decision of those users of the financial statements. Okay, So what happens if it could influence the decision of our users of the financial statements, then that information is material. For example, if I had known that the financial statements were misstated by $25 million, I would have never bought the stock. So it changed the decision of that potential investor. They did not would have not buy the stock if they know that the financial statements are misstated. And I just gave you a quantitative example of materiality because the financial statements were misstated by $25 million. And we're going to see in some of the later chapters, uh, chapter three actually, uh, so not that late, coming up pretty quick, that the auditor does need to come up with a quantitative measure of materiality, a literal dollar amount for our materiality so that as we go through and we find a misstatement that exceeds that materiality threshold, then we know that the financial statements are materially misstated and we're going to have to alert the users to that material misstatement. So this is the concept of materiality. Now I just gave you a quantitative example, but we do also need to consider qualitative factors as well. For example, Let's say the user says, we would not have bought that stock. The potential investor says, I would not have bought that stock if I had known that the financial statements were misstated by, now it's in only 25000 instead of $25 million, he says $25,000. If I had known that they were misstated by $25,000 because of management fraud. Now what? Now it's the qualitative aspect that made that a material fact. So we should consider qualitative and quantitative um, factors in determining the materiality. And uh, this allows us to, uh, to really uh, focus our audit resources, our audit efforts on items that are um, going to be more important. We're not looking for two cent errors, we're looking for material errors. We have the concept of audit risk. The concept of audit risk is the risk that the auditor will mistakenly give a un, um, give a clean opinion on the financial statements. The auditor will say that we do not believe that financial statements are materially misstated when in fact there is a material misstatement of financial statements. Now we don't do this on purpose, we do this mistakenly. Okay, This can happen to us because, for example, we'll talk about sampling in a minute, but we're not going to look at every single transaction. We're going to pull a sample of transactions. And if we pull that sample of transactions, there's always a chance that the sample will indicate that the financial statements are materially misstated when in fact, if we were able to look at every single transaction, we would have found that there was a material misstatement. We shouldn't have given a, given a clean audit opinion. We should have called out this material misstatement. So we accidentally, we mistakenly give a clean opinion when we should have uh, warned the user of the financial statements that there was a material misstatement. Um, another factor, audit risk, could be that we just make a mistake. Look, we are not human. We are human. We're not machines. And uh, there's always a chance that uh, we could uh, just simply make a mistake when we apply our audit procedure. Another factor that could lead us to um, giving the incorrect opinion and affect our audit risk is the idea of fraud and the concealment aspects of fraud. Look, we can't sit there and determine that we are in, uh, going to be uh, smarter than everybody else. There's always a chance that somebody, management, employees of the company could be so slick that they will get a misstatement past us and we will not identify that. So for that reason, we are only going to provide, we say that right in our auditor's report, that we are only going to provide reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are materially misstated. We do not um, provide absolute assurance. So there's always a chance that even though we are saying that we believe that the financial statements, in our opinion, are free of material misstatement, there's always a chance that there could be some sort of uh, 
misstatement in there. And it doesn't mean we're incompetent. It simply means that we are not infallible in giving our opinion on those financial statements. That's the concept of audit risk. We might mistakenly give the incorrect opinion. And we're going to look quite a bit at that in some of the upcoming chapters and see how this concept of audit risk is going to govern uh, much of what we do as we go through uh, and, and uh, apply our procedures. We've talked about evidence, okay, and just digging in a little bit to this idea of evidence. And when we look at evidence, we want to look at evidence that is, of course, going to be relevant. Well, what makes evidence relevant? Evidence is going to be relevant to us if it is relevant to the assertions. So again, everything so focuses around those assertions. So evidence is um, relevant if it gives me some information that helps me determine that an asset exists. So when we look at our evidence, we look at it in terms of its reliability. So we look at reliability of evidence, and there literally is a hierarchy as to how reliable evidence is. Auditors direct personal knowledge is king. It is number one. It is the most reliable evidence. So what do we have? We have an assertion. We have an assertion about an asset that is supposed to exist on the financial statements, the existence assertion. What do we do? We see that asset being listed on the financial statements as subsidiary ledger. We go from the financial statement and we go and take a walk and we look at that and we see that that equipment is actually there. We now have direct personal knowledge because we looked at that equipment. It fits the description of the subsidiary ledger. We now have direct personal knowledge that that asset exists. What I just laid out to you is an audit procedure over equipment that tests the um, existence assertion and I gave you the most reliable evidence that you could get in a situation like that which is the auditor's direct personal knowledge. Number two for reliability is the um, external evidence, external evidence that comes directly to the auditor from outside of the entity is more reliable than internal evidence such as invoices, etc., that are going to be inside the company that we would be uh, looking at if we were, say, looking at sales, we would look at their internally generated invoices. It's not as reliable as external evidence, but it is still more reliable than the least reliable evidence, which is oral evidence. Oral evidence in of itself is the least reliable piece of evidence, and we would always combine that with some other form of evidence. But we're looking at reliable evidence that is relevant to the assertions, and so one of our tasks is going to start to get comfortable with what evidence is relevant to the assertion and what is evidence that is going to be reliable. And we're going to see that the stronger our controls are, the more that we might be able to rely on evidence that is not as reliable. If management has good internal controls, a good roof over the house, we don't think that there's going to be as many misstatements hitting the financial statements, maybe we can use a little more internal evidence, maybe a little more oral evidence to support that assertion. If we don't believe that the controls are as effective, then we're going to go ahead and want to look at more of that direct auditor's personal knowledge to give us now sufficient evidence to support those assertions. But again, everything centers around that we do centers around the assertions. Sampling. We are not going to look at every single transaction. I think you can uh, imagine that. What if you're auditing McDonald's? What are you going to do? Audit every French fry sale? Okay, that's going to be impossible. You've seen the signs. They brag billions and billions in those signs all the time. You can't audit every single transaction of an entity, so you will need to take a sample of transactions. We're going to talk about sampling um, in our later chapters, or our, I guess our middle chapters. I think it's chapters uh, 8 and 9, where we'll look a little bit at... Um, Sampling may not be eight and nine, but it's coming in the in that range of chapters, and we're going to be looking at sampling there. 
Okay, we are not going to be able to look at every transaction, so we will have to pull a sample of transactions and see if we can form conclusions based on that sample. Now that means that there's always that chance of audit risk, right? Audit risk can never be zero because there's always a chance that we will look at the sample and form an incorrect conclusion based on the sample, right? Because it's not the true population. There's a chance that the sample results could be different than the true condition of the population. So we will always uh, have some audit risk and a lot of that uh, often comes because we use sampling procedures. Now before you start to panic and think that you're going to have to relive your entire uh, statistics class to be able to understand that uh, material, don't worry. It is much more terminology and uh, your understanding of how we use sampling and how sampling allows us to draw conclusions than it is having to crunch a bunch of uh, statistical, you know, calculations, etc. So we'll get into that in some of the later, later chapters, but we certainly use sampling. Coming over to the next slide, major phases of the audit. Now, we start to in my opinion in this chapter get a little bit too deep in some of these major phases of the audit and uh, some of your homework questions that I'm going to go with you, over with you um, here after we um, complete um, going through these slides um, you're, you're going to see uh, some areas I'm going to point out that I think they may be jumped a little bit in expecting you to understand some of these things but it doesn't hurt us to uh, really, you know, sort of understand this at 30,000 feet right now, even though some of your homework questions, I notice, do tend to get a little, uh, little too much into the terrain on some of these. But let's start out with client acceptance. Very important, very beginning of the audit. Should we accept a client? Well, one of the key things when you're deciding whether or not you're going to accept a client is you want to avoid a client whose management lacks integrity. Why? If management lacks integrity, then they are not going to be as vigilant in the preparation of that financial statements and making sure that they have the internal controls to uh, help prepare financial statements that are free of material misstatement. And our job just got a lot harder because now we're going to have to consider the chance that there's some sort of misstatement uh, due to fraud and we are going to uh, have to uh, obtain much more uh, reliable evidence to allow us to determine the financial statements are fairly stated. So our sample sizes are going to be bigger and we're going to be having more direct personal knowledge and much uh, less uh, being able to use some of that oral evidence. So what happens? The way you avoid problems there is just don't accept a client if you have indication that management lacks integrity. Now, how will you determine if management lacks integrity? Well, they're going to require, remember we talked about auditing standards, and I did say that there are some standards for auditing. It's not like we just sort of do all this by the seat of our pants. We will be looking at standards for audits, um, auditing standards board from the AICPA for our non-public companies, for our public companies. We look into the public company accounting oversight board requirements, and they require that we speak to the predecessor auditor before we accept a client. What the heck's a predecessor auditor? Well, let's say you audited last year's financial statements and your client decides to change and hire me as the auditor for the second year. So you're the auditor for year one, I'm the auditor for year two, you would be the predecessor auditor, I would be the successor auditor. There are required communications that I have to have with you, the predecessor, me, the successor, before I can accept that in a client. And one of those required communication is, does management lack integrity? So we would be needing to ask that predecessor that right out of the gate. Um, now, there are other methods, but that's one that is specifically called out in the standards as something that needs to happen. So client acceptance is very important. Now, we look at it from the standpoint of us looking at the client and saying, should we accept this client and the client lack integrity, etc. But we also have to look at the firm's ability to properly service that client. So if we have um, too small of staff to properly complete that audit, then we can't accept that client. And when I say I can't, we can't, we can't. The standards, you know, this is our ethical standards, say that we should not accept a client if we do not believe that we can reasonably complete that audit. And it is not okay to get halfway through the audit and say, oops, 
My bad, I thought I could complete this, but now I can't. That would be an unethical step that you made if you did made that sort of a decision, even though you may not have done it on purpose, it is not appropriate. So we take that very seriously. You need to look at the firm's ability to serve as a client. Um, do you have the sufficient knowledge of the industry to be able to successfully complete that audit? Now this is interesting and in that the standards don't tell us that you have to have the knowledge before you accept the client. You may not have knowledge about that industry, but you will need to acquire that knowledge quickly enough to be able to complete that audit successfully. So if you're in a not very complex business, I don't know, grocery store or something, I don't know how complex a grocery store is, but if it's not a very complex um, industry, then maybe you could acquire that knowledge uh, quickly enough to uh, properly complete that audit. But if we're talking more and more complex industry, I don't know, you're looking at... Uh, super colliders or something like that, you know, then it's unlikely that you're going to be able to, in a relatively short time to acquire the knowledge to complete us uh, to properly uh, complete that audit. So you not only need to look at the client, but the firm's ability to successfully complete that audit as well. We talk about preliminary engagement activities, and the key word here is preliminary. These are things that you do in the early stages. You will make early assessments of your audit risk, early assessment of your materiality. Start thinking about the type of evidence that you're going to need. Start talking, thinking about and talking with management about the extent that you're going to need involvement in their staff, maybe their internal audit staff to help you. You're going to need some specialists to come in. Those sort of things come in uh, as you go through your preliminary engagement activities. Then you plan the audit. The scope of the audit is planned out and you will then look at those internal controls. Remember the internal controls are something that if the auditor sees and believes and assesses that the controls have operating effectiveness and those controls are reliable, that will affect how we're going to do our audit work. And again, we focus around the assertions. If we see strong controls over the assertions for a particular account, we can, again, not have to take as big of a sample size to look at those transactions, and we can rely more on, say, internal evidence and external evidence in support of the assertion uh, for that particular assertion for that account. We see not as effective controls over assertions, then we're going to probably take larger sample sizes and expect a little bit more external evidence, auditors direct personal knowledge in support of that. So we'll look at those controls and based on that we will go ahead and start to audit the actual transactions say revenue and again how much work we do the nature of the evidence that we acquire will be based on that consideration the internal control we talk about completion of the audit this happens um, at the end where there are some uh, additional procedures that we have to apply for example um, getting an attorney a, a letter from the client's attorney there needs to be direct communication between the auditor and the client's attorney to determine if there are litigation claims assessments that need to be disclosed potential contingent losses that need to be booked in the financial statements key step around there is that client attorney letter we get a management representation letter that's a letter from management at the end of the audit and it is sort of a CYA step if you will where management goes ahead and uh, swears off to us that they've given us complete information they've told us about fraud etc but these are sort of administrative steps towards the end of the audit we then evaluate the results of all that and we will then issue our audit report so, give you a sense, again, we're at 30,000 feet here, but these are some areas that we're going to be looking at. We'll get into the audit report, which is the end product of all of our work uh, towards the end of the class in Chapter 18. But just to give us a sense uh, at a high level uh, what these reports would look like. And when we look at the report, um, and this is the report for public company that they're talking about here, we have an introductory paragraph. We have a scope paragraph and an opinion paragraph. Introductory paragraph calls out the financial statements that we are auditing. Scope paragraph describes the nature of the auditor's work. We follow generally accepted um, auditing standards. We follow GAS, generally accepted auditing standards, GAS. Okay. Opinion paragraph says that we believe the financial statements are fairly stated in accordance with GAAP, generally accepted accounting 
procedures, and that's where we give our opinion as to whether or not we think the financial statements are fairly stated. So this looks at our report, and the reports for non-public companies, and we'll look at those in Chapter 18, are a little different from this. Uh, there's been some changes in this area lately, and so there are some uh, differences between the non-public and the public company, including this idea of an unqualified opinion. That's what we call it if we're talking about um, a public company, but if it's a non-public company, we call it unmodified. Okay, and that's maybe a better term for you to get used to, unmodified. Okay, unmodified opinion. We could also have a qualified opinion and we can have an adverse opinion. What do these terms mean? Well, let's just go over uh, to the next slide. Okay, we're going to talk about each one of these starting with the unqualified opinion. Okay, and if we have an unqualified opinion, I'm going to use a highly technical drawing over here to give you the emotion of the auditor if we're having an unqualified opinion and you can see that the auditor, if that's the auditor, the auditor is happy when there's an unqualified opinion. We also call this unmodified, okay? So again, remember, uh, if we're talking about a um, non-public company and the term unmodified is probably more relevant these days, uh, we would have an unmodified opinion. Okay, And so what does that mean? We That means that we think the financial statements are free of material misstatement. The auditor is what? The auditor is going to be happy. Okay, So that means that we are giving a clean opinion and uh, it means that we believe that the financial statements are free and again a material misstatement we're not looking for two cent errors okay let's just use a silly example here okay obviously we're already in the land is silly because the auditor is happy here but let's say that um, you have a buddy that wants you to tell you uh, what he thinks of the suit that he's going to use for a job interview so you go over and you look at the suit and he comes out in a great suit, okay? Sh you know, a shirt, tie, shoes look great, the suit looks great, everything. And you say, man, you look great, unmodified, unqualified. You look good for your job interview. That's a great suit. You just gave your buddy an unmodified opinion on that suit that you think it looks good. You gave him a clean opinion. Now, you come over we talk about a qualified opinion. What happens here? Well, now the auditor gives a qualified opinion if the auditor does believe that there is some sort of material misstatement in the financial statements. Okay, and so the auditor will qualify their opinion under those circumstances. So let's go ahead and stick with our uh, highly technical drawing here. Let's go ahead and uh, come up with the auditor's emotion now. And uh, now the auditor is what has gone from happy to sad. Okay, now the auditor is sad. The auditor is saying, you know, I believe there is a material misstatement in these financial statements. So let's go back to your buddy. Your buddy comes out in his suit, and when you get down to the shoes, he's wearing a pair of Air Jordans. And you say, well, what suit are you going to wear? I mean, excuse me, what shoes are you going to wear to the interview tomorrow? You got the suit, but the shoes, there's Air Jordans, everything else looks good. Oh, I'm going to wear Air Jordans to the interview because I want to show my future employer that I can jump over tall buildings in a single bound. I'm a very energetic employee, whatever it is. You say, no, do not wear those shoes to the job interview. You're going to ruin your chances to get the job, right? So you tell your buddy your suit, your outfit looks fine, except for the shoes, okay? And so when we give a qualified opinion, the auditor is not happy about that misstatement, but they're saying the financial statements are free of material misstatement except for this thing that I'm calling out in my opinion and telling the users of the financial statements, those absentee owners, there's a problem here, okay? Management should have capitalized some leases. They did not. 
as a result, the financial statements are, um, are fine, except for the material misstatement of the uh, leases that were not disclosed. Okay? Now, this could be one misstatement. It could be um, you know, several misstatements. It is auditor's judgment as to whether or not the misstatements constitute the need for a qualified opinion in which we're going to say we're sad. And shoes, you know, your buddy wearing Air Jordans to a job interview is a very material issue, isn't it? And so you would go ahead and you would qualify. You'd say your suit looks good except for the shoes. The financial statements look good except for the capitalization of the leases, whatever it is. And it could be anything where there was not uh, compliance with GAAP. Now what happens? If those non-compliance with general accepted account principles go from bad to worse, we go ahead and we give an adverse opinion. So let's stick with our theme here of the uh, face. The auditor is so sad now, those are tears I'm trying to draw there. The auditor is now crying, okay? The auditor is crying. The auditor is very sad about these financial statements. And the auditor is saying that there are so many misstatements or it could be just one misstatement that is so large that we do not believe that the financial statements should be relied upon. So this is an adverse opinion, and it means that we do not believe that the financial statements should be relied upon. Now, go back to your buddy. You go and you look at your buddy's suit for the job interview, and... Uh, he comes out in a complete sweat outfit. Now, not just the Air Jordan shoes, the whole outfit is a sweat outfit. You say, what are you going to wear to the job interview tomorrow? He says, oh, I'm going to wear this. I want to show that I'm a very fast runner and independent thinker, whatever it is he's trying to communicate. You say, no, you cannot wear that suit. I give you an adverse opinion on the whole suit. You can't wear that. You're going to get carried out of the building by security if you wear that suit. Now you've given your buddy an adverse opinion. When the auditor says that, they're saying that you cannot rely on those financial statements and it's either because there was uh, you know, several errors or one big error that results in an adverse opinion um, on the financials. Okay, So that's just giving you a high level look at the type of the reports. And the reason we're doing this uh, here, I believe, is, is that uh, we'll be talking about things and how it'll affect the auditor's report, whether it be the auditor is able to give an unmodified opinion, a qualified opinion, adverse, and you're going to be, well, what's that? Well, now you have a sense, and what we're going to do in Chapter 18 is really dig in and see what the structure of the report looks like under these different conditions. But that's the last chapter um, that we're going to have test material on and that's going to be on our final so we won't have to worry about those details but we do want to understand these different types of opinion uh, at this point because it helps us with our discussions as we go through um, some of the other chapters. Okay, so that pretty much gets us through um, the chapter here. Again, remember, um, you know, we're looking at logical processes here that are going to allow us to uh, basically uh, make our decisions about the financial statements, okay? And so um, uh, I said this in the introductory uh, video that you're going to be using your imagination here as the auditor thinks about how to gather the best evidence to uh, support the assertions in the financial statements. And also, I think it's important that you maintain your imagination as you visualize yourself doing the different audit procedures. And I think we started that a little bit here as we started talking about uh, how the auditor uh, would uh, test the existence assertion over equipment by actually going and looking at that piece of equipment. Rights and obligations, asking for the bill of sale uh, when they acquired that equipment, etc. Okay, and we'll get much more into those sort of procedures as we go through. Okay, that is our lecture for Chapter 1. Uh, now I'm going to uh, come back on the screen and talk to you a little bit about um, some of your homework questions. So let's go ahead and let's do that.